This podcast is part of the SJ Network. Go to s-j-network.com for more great podcasts and for contact information on publicist Steve Joyner. Listening to In a City Like Yours, a semi monthly podcast featuring interesting people with interesting life stories. This podcast may contain language and or subject matter not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Michael Glenn Moore. If you have an interesting life story and would like to appear on the show, please drop me a note at in a city like yours at gmail.com. Also, join our Facebook page at In a City Like Yours Podcast to receive notices of new releases and other info. Now, please welcome today's guest. I'm Kristen Stovall. I come from Salina, Kansas, and I'm an author, but I've got a little bit of a story that led me into that. It started when I was in my late teens. I kind of played around with writing, but it didn't occur to me that I wanted to be a storyteller. I thought, oh, I want to be an actress and tell stories that way. And then I discovered I liked making my own worlds and characters. But as many young people do, I met a young man and fell in love and got married when I was uh, 20. I'm thinking now it's been a little while. (laughs) I was 27 when we got married and it was great and wonderful. Uh, Dustin was an amazing, amazing person. Um, He had suffered a traumatic brain injury when he was 18 and had all the doctors said he wasn't going to make it. And if he did, he was going to be a vegetable. And, you know, he proved them wrong. He he not only woke up, but he regained most of his mobility and, you know, was able to function and do a lot of stuff. And I had met him before his accident and I had a crush on him, but (laughs) it didn't really go anywhere. He was very, very popular and I was very, very shy. But we were in a show, a couple of plays, one of them I think many people are familiar with, The Odd Couple. And we reconnected after his accident and fell in love through the process of that and got married one day before what would have been our three year dating anniversary. But unfortunately, life is not always happily ever after. It usually has a lot of twists and turns and bumps, and we don't always end up where we think we're going to. As a result of his traumatic brain injury, he uh, suffered with a lot of chronic pain and depression. And a year and a half into our marriage, he simply could not take the pain anymore. And his depression had gotten to a state where he he, he just couldn't keep going. And I found myself uh, going from newlywed to widow at 28 years old. And let me tell you, when something like that happens, you have no idea what you're going to do. It's not just the the person that you loved that's died. It's it's several lives. It's the children you would have had. The you know, it's the holidays you would have celebrated. The person you would have been if they had stayed and you'd grown old together. And I was really just left wondering, well, what now? This is, we we didn't have any children. We were only together for a year and a half. Why did that happen? Why, Why was I even put in this situation? And through the unbelievably painful process of going through all of that and saying goodbye and trying to understand why a life with me wasn't enough, I had this idea for a scene between two characters and it was a young woman saying goodbye to the spirit of the the man that she had been married to and it kind of stuck with me and gave me a little bit of peace as I developed the characters and the story and it it gave me a reason for 
everything that happened. And, you know, it was a reason I made up in my own head. These things happen and you can't control them. But I needed that reason. I needed that rationalization for it. I was very, very blessed in that the last conversation I had with Dustin, we did end it saying, I love you. And that I, I treasure that to this day. But anyway, that kind of fed into that scene of saying goodbye. And before long, I realized I had a book. And then as I was outlining and going through it, I realized I had a trilogy. And so I started working on the first book, Soulbound, and developing this character who also is a young widow. And it was really my way of processing and telling people what I felt, but in a in a way that I felt safe doing it. Dustin was very well known in our community. Salina is not a big town. He was, a, you know, a, I would say a bit of a local celebrity. So when he died and, and he did commit suicide in a public place, not in front of people, but you know, his body was found. Uh, it, it, it was a very public thing. Even people who didn't know him or know of him heard about the, the body that they found. And yeah, it was rough. I had people walk down my street as, and I'd be sitting on the porch and they would see me sitting on the porch and they, I would hear them go, oh, is that where that guy lived? The one that killed himself? And I'm just like, wow, thanks. <laughs> great you know I'm just sitting here it's fine that's what I want to be reminded of and the family who found him like took pictures and uh, forwarded it around and there were rumors and it was just so just talking about it wasn't comfortable but writing about it in a fantasy format that it was not me and it was not Dustin and it was not Salina, Kansas, but it, it was the emotions and the difficulty and, and working through all of that. And with each book, it was like a different level of the grieving and processing journey. It, it's just, it's been very, very therapeutic and it, it's been wonderful. And then when I finished the third book, it was a little bit like saying goodbye again, but in a more it, on my terms it was on my terms and I named the last book Boundless because he really wanted to start a theater company for disabled individuals where they would have an avenue to act and perform and he was going to call it Boundless Theater Company and so to honor him I named the final book Boundless and I now also publish under a uh, sort of umbrella company of boundless fantasy so it's it's been amazing <laughs> it's I mean it was a terrible start but I'm in a good place and I'm just really really blessed that I got to have him in my life even for that small period of time and that I'm able to give that time something of a legacy because we didn't have children in fact my mother calls them grand books they're her grand books <laughs> So that's, that's kind of my story. I mean, there's a lot of different turns to it. Some very dark days, some very happy days, learning how compassionate people can be, even when there are people who aren't compassionate. I would say the majority of them have been amazing and supportive and wonderful. But, yeah. Yeah, it just goes to show that if you're one of those people who are going to say something negative, you could have a bigger effect than those who are positive. Because I mean, you, you you will remember forever what it felt like to have those people say that when you were, they were walking down your street or what the family did when they found Justin, Dustin, um, you know, taking photographs of him. I mean- Yeah, they took photographs of the body. That's insane. I mean, that's not yeah, something normal it. people would do and that you had to you deal with You would think not. <laughs> yeah, oh. it was. Amazing. And I kept that uh, quiet for a very, very long time because I didn't want his parents, I mean, his parents who are already dealing with the loss of a child, I didn't want them to know about that on top of it. But it has been, you know, this happened in 2010. So it's been almost 12 years. It was May 1st, 2010. It's just not a day you forget. 
And since then, you know, I have told them since the wound is not as fresh. I, I just can't imagine it's ever not completely raw as a parent. I, you know, but I, I didn't really want to share that with them for a while. They had enough to deal with and enough to feel. So, yeah, I, I will never forget it. <laughs> yeah, suicide has touched my family. My brother committed suicide back in the 80s, and he was uh, addicted to medication, painkillers, and uh, just finally had enough and, and took his life. But I, I can relate to how devastating that could be. The, the, the questions that you go through, you tell yourself or you ask yourself, you know, was there something I could have done? And of course, my mother and my father were just total, totally beside themselves for many, many, many years. It's just absolute devastation. And there's, you know, there's mem remembrance of his birthday and remembrance of his death day. And um, yeah. so that, that's at least twice a year. And then there's Christmas and the holidays, Thanksgiving, yep. and all these times where, where they're not there with you. And then you experience something great in your life. And you, and you But then you look and say, oh, I wish so-and-so, yeah. so, you know, I wish my brother would have been there. Or, or in your case, I wish Dustin had been here to share this with me. Right. You know, it's yeah, just really, I, really sad. Was I he call not, them emotional landmines. They catch you every he, once in a while. Yeah. Was he in, in any type of therapy? He was in therapy um, and they were trying different antidepressants, but it, there's a lot of, you know, trial and error with antidepressants. And I'm not anti-therapy or anti-medication. If a person needs therapy and they need antidepressants or anxiety medication, then they need to be speaking to their doctor and get the care they need. Um, it just, for him, it, it didn't work or we were too late. I mean, you, I could go over it again and again in my head and try and figure out where it went wrong but at the end of the day it's not going to change what happened and it's just going to drive me bonkers <laughs> yeah it, it was his choice go. it was his it choice was. To, to go ahead and get away from that uh and you know you can't really second guess him it's too late for that and right. um but uh so so your books are based on your store uh, your life with him or loosely based uh, not entirely based. I would say my books in in some ways are inspired by some of the things. They're certainly inspired by the process of being widowed at a young age and still feeling that connection. And I think anyone who's lost somebody that they really care about, you do feel that connection like they're still around you. Um, even after they're gone, you feel it for a very long time. To this day, I still sometimes will just feel like he's around you know and and maybe it's just a feeling maybe it's just a hunch but it's also kind of nice to think sometimes they drop in and check on you you know but i don't know <laughs> scientifically speaking or whatever but it gives me comfort to think it <laughs> yeah a lot of people would would turn to their faith and say that's what's what's going on there i'm personally i'm no. an atheist so i don't right i don't believe in a religion but you know i'm, I'm still on the fence about uh, what happens to us after we die, you know, right. if we're, if yeah. we're just going to another plane or have an existence on a different, different level or not. Um, but you're, you've, you've written the three books. Are there any, uh, other works in progress that you'd like to talk to start on or? Well, um, actually, as a matter of fact, the prequel to the trilogy, the twisted path releases, uh, uh, next Friday, which is December 10th. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but it's it's right around the corner. <laughs> so, and then I'm also working on a new series that I'm co-writing with a friend and fo fellow author, and that will be called The Fae Touched Chronicles with the first book, Seer's Choice. We're hoping for a release in February, so I've been busy. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your writing process? What what? And you said you were interested since you were a teenager in writing but what really did you I, I've, I've tried to write i just cannot seem to finish anything i start novels and novels and then i get the first two or three chapters down and then i can't finish because so i guess because i don't know how to do an outline or anything like that so i don't really go into a book with the aspect of having the first a middle uh, a beginning a middle and an end uh what is it like for you and how do you organize yourself to complete something like that well, for each book, it's just a little bit different. I do have 
a sort you know i have certain things that i do i always handwrite my outlines for some reason it's if i put it on the computer it just doesn't stick or something so i have a journal and i'll handwrite my outlines in that and the way i i don't do a traditional outline in that it's just sort of like the the highlights and stuff what i'll do is sort of look at each chapter as its own little miniature book and i'll sort of Right, really just sort of very rough, very glossed over, I don't know, almost many stories, not quite. It's certainly not as in involved as a first draft, but I just, I hand write it out. And this is generally after I've toyed with the characters and the story and the world for, for a while. Uh, Soulbound, I really thought about that for, it was maybe five years before I started writing it because uh, Dustin passed in 2010 and Soulbound did not come out until 2015. And it took me about a year beginning to finish to write that one because I was learning what I was doing. <laughs> and that's counting the editorial process, which I have you know, somebody else go and rip it to shreds and destroy my ego. <laughs> and then I go back through and pick myself up off the ground and listen to what they say. <laughs> um, do you go through any kind of ritual before you write? Do you sit down and meditate for a second or two? Or, you know, what, what's your artistic process with writing? Well, coffee has to happen. <laughs> there has to be like a <laughs> cup or two of coffee. <laughs> Usually what I'll do is I'll go on to YouTube and I'll find songs that either kind of match the scenes that I'm going to be writing. Or sometimes I'll look at fan videos that have like different characters from shows that sort of match in my head what those characters look like and or it'll ma it'll be similar to sort of the visual of a world or the costuming or something just something to kind of put my mind in that place and to to think within those terms and to visualize i mean i don't copy any of those scenes or anything like that but it just sort of gets me in that headspace yeah listening to music is very powerful i mean oh, songs yeah. songs can really do quite a bit in three minutes i know the woman i can't remember her name uh who wrote the twilight series uh, oh yeah stephanie myers yeah she based a lot of her stories on uh or through what she listened to by by muse the muse yeah. uh yeah. Th that band and um so that's that's something that's per apparently common for people who are creative to kind of yeah. <laughs> get, get some thinking in a different way because you know it's it's a little bit different music and writing a novel but you know you, you can right. the two can come together oh yeah and That's and sometimes it'll just be like one little piece of music will make me start to sort of visualize a scene almost like a movie like i'm sitting there listening to the the soundtrack or the score of the movie and visualizing what's happening and that's actually how the scene for the first book came about as i heard some piece of music and started visualizing this scene and that was how i decided how it would end i knew that it would have one of two endings but i hadn't chosen till the end of the second book which way it was going to go because up to that point i could write it and not have decided and then i heard another piece of music that just you know then that scene was there and i saw what was supposed to happen so music helps a lot what's what genre are they are they romance or they um, are epic fantasy but there are elements of romance in them and it's both men and women have liked it so you know at least they tell me they like it i don't know maybe they're just being nice when they're <laughs> looking when they're face to face with me <laughs> so you said you took a while for you to write the first one uh but then you got i guess the other two came along pretty quickly after that it took me a year beginning to finish to write the first one, and that's after I actually sat down and started writing. And then the second one, I was working on that within a few months of getting the first one out, and I got that one written and edited, I think, in about six months, although I do believe I waited until the next year to get it published. I'd have to make sure. Sometimes it's kind of a blur because I go into my own little world and forget <laughs> that there's other stuff going on. And then with the third one, I think I just intimidated myself a little bit, but it took me a couple of years to really get that one out because you have to, you've spent two books building up to this ending and building an audience and you want to make sure that you, you stick the landing, you know? <laughs> so it, it took me a little while to get 
to really get going on that one. And I think it's mostly that I psyched myself out about it. Are you considering doing anything other than writing novels? Are you, do you write short stories now and, or have you published in magazines or anything like that? Um, I think I'll probably stick with um, novels just because I enjoy the world development. I like long involved stories and something that I really, what I enjoy the most is developing a world and developing characters and seeing how they change through the course of their journey. So that's really what I find the most gratifying and that's more difficult in, in shorter stories. Although I have actually, I did publish a very small article on some gamer website because it was about a game that I played and I happened to know this person who worked for the website and I had opinions about a thing they did. So they said, well, write a, write a piece on it. So I did do that. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, it was fun. It was a totally different experience. Just like so, co-writing has been a totally different experience. Co-writing with who? Uh, with a friend and fellow author named Jennifer Sanders. And she has a few books out with uh, somebody else. She prefers to, to partner. And we'd act, we've known each other for, gosh, it's got to be close to 20, maybe even more years at this point. And we had written these stories just for fun. And we, the way we do it is we each take a character and then we will get in some sort of shared typing format and then write the story, but each of us writing, you know, sort of driving one of the different characters. Like we know the, which point of view it's in and we'll stick with that, but each of us will be a different character. So sometimes the characters will be having conversations back and forth and it's actually us taking turns replying to the other one. So it's, it's almost like playing a game. It's really fun. Yeah, that sounds fascinating because it's like you're having a conversation with oh. another character in your book and you actually are. Yeah. You know, in a way. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's and you get very, very swept up in it. <laughs> and so we do have to go back and go. Okay, did we just go off the rails here? <laughs> you know? Are Are there any uh, any prospects of having your books uh, translated or done in uh, Audible audio? Yes, I'm actually in the process of getting the first book in the trilogy, Soulbound. Uh, put together for audio and then I, I have it worked out for the same narrator to do Soulfire which is the second book and then Boundless the third and then for the Twisted Path since that one's just coming out um, on Friday gonna give that a little time I'm just, right now I'm just kind of going okay everything's where it needs to be for the first time ever I was ahead <laughs> you know, I wasn't running to the last minute and usually I wait just a little while because it it is a process and you have to find the right the right narrator and the format of Twisted Path is a little bit different in that the two main leads really kind of they're com completely equal leads. So I'm thinking what I'm going to need to do is have a male narrator and a female narrator to change uh, between the different perspectives. Uh, to be have you on done, and happy. <laughs> yeah. Have you done any uh, other theater since? I have done some theater since. I haven't been able to in the last several years just because things are picking up with the books and I'm now juggling multiple projects. Uh, well, and also there's the pandemic. <laughs> so there haven't really, there for a while, there weren't uh, really a lot of plays going on. But I did, um, I was in a show called. And I'm totally, lend me a tenor. Totally blanked there for a second. <laughs> but it was called Lend Me a Tenor, and it's an absolutely hilarious show. And I actually got to play the female lead in that. So that was fun. That was the first show I did after going back to the theater after Dustin died. So it was just a very special experience. And the director had known Dustin. So it was just, it was, it was really, and in fact, it, one of Dustin's best friends was in the show too. And most of the cast knew him. So it was just this really, really special. Uh, moment and I got nominated for an acting award in that one too. So oh, that was fun. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I didn't win that time, but and then I have also done another show, Laughter on the Twenty Third Floor, and I got nominated for that too. And I did, I did win that time. <laughs> oh, well, double, double congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's just the local community theater, but I have my little trophy, and I'm like, yes, yes, I accept this Oscar. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the the local theaters here during the 
uh, during COVID in the in 2020, uh, they would put on uh, video play. Mm. So they, the uh, the cast would get together and they would film it on stage with the set and and all that. But it wouldn't be an audience, live audience. They'd show it on online. I can't, you know, however they do it, they, yeah. you know. So, but uh, that turned out. I thought it was pretty cool. So well, the community theater is they're doing shows again. In fact, they're doing White Christmas this year i know they had they had these really interesting masks that were like clear plastic and then mike fit underneath them and so then the cast could be on stage and do the show and i think they had like socially distanced seating i don't know i haven't gone <laughs> i i really want to go see white christmas but we'll see if the holiday schedules are so crazy as the what you've dealt with as far as covid and the the lockdown and all we went through 2020 has that affected your artistic um bent any or i mean has it given you ideas well i i wrote the twisted path which is almost 600 pages in three months so not being able to go do much definitely yeah. affected. <laughs> i mean i was just a writing machine um it did. It was really disappointing because 2020 was the year I was going to start doing cons because the entire trilogy was out at that point. And I had had that planned from the beginning to wait and do con appearances and booths at cons and like wait until the whole trilogy was out. And then 2020 hit the year that that was supposed to happen. And and then I didn't get to do, you know, I usually have a few in-person events. I have a friend who's a teacher and she always asks me to come in and talk to her class. She's an English English teacher. So that was my very first Zoom meeting this year that I didn't do it this year, but the year before uh, I did a Zoom meeting. And of course, right at that moment, I got someone was knocking at the door. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, I had to it's, tell this class of high schoolers, I am so sorry, but I've got to go get that because it's a Christmas gift. <laughs> it, it's so weird how our, our the way we deal with things have changed so much since then. You know, like like using Zoom a lot. I mean, who would have thought that Zoom would have been this popular and in everybody's life practically? You know, right. So I mean, it's been a, it's been a positive thing. You know, because we can all get together and chat and see each other and things like that but it's just so different than what we had in 2019 and what, what life was like so yeah. of course we're dating the podcast now this uh, it won't be everything now <laughs> right right now your future generations will look back and go wow that, yeah. <laughs> that was recorded during the pandemic <laughs> how, how old are you <laughs> you were right. there you were there for the pandemic you were alive during the ancient times. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to chat about? Gosh. <laughs> I mean, we've covered the books. I do have this upcoming series, The Fate Touched Chronicles. We could talk about that a little bit because sure. it's exciting. Um, it's a totally different universe than, than the Song of Souls trilogy. It actually takes place in... The 1890s, it takes place in Victorian Scotland, at least some of the stories do. And the concept is that there are certain people who have magic in this world. They have magic, and the reason that they have magic is that they have uh, fey blood. So, you know, like like the blood of the fairies and stuff somewhere in their ancestry, and it gives them these abilities. And uh, the series itself doesn't have an a, a storyline that stretches over the entire series but it has sort of characters and we follow different characters at different times and and see what their story is so it's sort of everybody's a little bit connected and some of the stories do connect on some levels but they're also individual stories and it's been really fun it's been a different experience and we're really looking forward to introducing all of our characters we think they're pretty cool we like them, <laughs> except for the bad guys. We don't like them. <laughs> Who are your favorite authors that kind of give you ideas, whatever it is you'd love to read? I absolutely love Tolkien. He's amazing. Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, all of them love those. I, I actually got started really writing, like, back when I would dabble around with Lord of the Rings fan fiction way back when I was, you know, when I was young and innocent and <laughs> didn't know all the things life had in store for me. It was just sort of a fun way for me to play in someone else's sandbox while I developed my writing skills. And that's actually where I met my co-writer, Jennifer Sanders. 
And then I also really love an author, I believe she's Australian, and her name is Juliet Marlier. And she writes these fantastic fantasy novels, but they usually are sort of based also in history and folklore. My favorite is the Seven Waters series, which takes place in a medieval Irish setting. So, and it's, oh, they're just so good. She's, I love her. <laughs> well, well, Those since, are my two favorites. <laughs> since your new series is based in 1800s, how do you prepare for that? How do you I mean, approach luckily it? for me, I have always, I, I like history. I have a tendency to lean more toward European and, and British history. So it wasn't a huge stretch because I, I love period miniseries and things like that. And I like to look at the different the different um, social and economic things that were happening in the monarchies. So I kind of had, you know, I had a broad idea of what the world was like then. And in fact, the first book takes place, it would be, uh, it, it's shortly after the bulk of the Jack the Ripper murders. So it's all kind of around that time period, it's 1890. And so I did a little research on that and kind of how it affected the different classes and how it affected different people. And then one of our characters, and it's one that I write, is a doctor. So I did a whole lot of research on the medical profession in the late 1800s. And, and it was really interesting how much it varied from country to country. Like even between America and and England, there was a sort of vast difference in how it was approached. And it's alarming how little formal education they needed. <laughs> and like there was no sort of degree or anything. It's just, it, it was, yeah, let's just say I'm really glad I did not have to depend on the medical field of that time nowadays. <laughs> We're very lucky. Do you have any of your books handy that you could maybe read us a little bit of something? I mean, I might be able to actually, you know what? I do have, I do have my books on Kindle and I have, <laughs> I think I could, I have the, I just, it occurred to me, I've got the manuscripts on my computer that I am staring at right now. Oh, cool. Well, that, that way we can, <laughs> we can end the, end the podcast with a quote from you or a recitation. Yes. I think would be interesting. I, I'll tell you what, I will get twisted path out and that will this will be the first place that has ever gotten a reading of okay, that cool. book excellent so, all righty chapter one daughter of the vacherat kenna lay in bed staring up at the filmy canopy that surrounded her the sun was not yet risen but she'd been awake for hours this was the last morning she would wake in this house it was the last time she would leave her bedroom and join her parents and siblings on the veranda for the morning meal this would always be her home, and yet soon it would not. In a matter of hours, Kenna would begin the long trek to the neighboring kingdom of Vinalis. She would leave Arthen's golden sea of dunes to marry a man she'd only met once before and build a life with him in a land of emerald hills and winding streams. Ian was handsome and kind, and Kenna had every faith that he'd make a fine husband. But every beginning marked the end of something else. This one marked the end of Kenna's childhood. Excitement, sadness, and apprehension were warring for dominance inside her, and it made it, it made any further sleep impossible. There would be many adjustments. The governance of her own country was vastly different from the monarchy of Vinalis. Arthen was made up of ten clans known as Vasherats. Each Vasherat had a leader, usually the eldest daughter of the previous leader. The leaders of the Vasherats met twice a year to decide upon matters of state and pass verdicts on crimes too serious to be judged by, by one person. This method of governing had been in place for over a century, and though there were rivalries between some of the Vasherats, the foundations of Arthen were strong. As the third daughter of the leader of her own Vasherat, the Rital, Kenna was well educated in the history and laws of her homeland. But Ian's homeland was run by one, a king who held power over all who lived within the borders. Kenna knew she would have to adjust, and adjust quickly. Bird calls pierced the air outside, drifting through the open bedroom window. Kenna sat up with a sigh and pushed the netting aside to climb out of bed and greet the morning. She loved the sight of dawn's rays spreading across the sandy peaks that lay beyond the oasis city of Rita, home of the Rital. According to legend, if one looked at the peak of the furthest dune at the moment of the sunrise, they would catch a glimpse of the summer goddess, Shavri, in her palace of light and pearl. 
In her 18 years of life, Kenna had yet to prove the stories true. Not that she often woke early enough to test the theory or even thought to do it every time she did, but she liked to think that there was something of truth to the ancient tales. The world held plenty of magic, both in truth and in spirit. Kenna possessed a great desire to see as much of the world as she could. It was one of the reasons she'd approached her parents with the idea of a betrothal to a family outside of Arthen. There was something exciting in the prospect of striking out from the familiar from her the familiarity of home to build a new life in a far-off land. She looked forward to the chance to immerse herself in the customs and traditions of another culture. The prospect held a promise of adventure and purpose. Kenna sighed and focused on the present. Now wasn't the time for flights of fancy. Her family's rival Vasherat, the Stratham, was growing bolder with each passing day. Her mother and father needed the military support that an alliance with the noble fam with a noble family of Vanalis would bring. High Lord Eden's troops were known for their discipline and prowess on the field of battle. The High Lord himself was a respected general in his youth and had fought a fought at King Fergal's side before the throne was established, and Fergal was crowned king. By aligning themselves with such a family, the Rital would receive a small contingent of men, and their own forces would be trained in the same techniques that had helped unite a kingdom. In exchange, the High Lord's family would gain trade routes through Rital's territory, and access to the nearly unbreakable metal produced therein, not to mention the prestige that came with allying themselves to a family as old and respected as Kenna's. give a shout out to Ben, the editor of this show. Ben also has a podcast called Two Marks and a Spark. You can find it wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Check it out. You won't be sorry.